Okay, we're back. So, I hope you're ready. Uh, fair warning first. I have uh, 60 slides, so we have to go through it uh, at a good pace, otherwise you're going to be here for a long time. Um, again, as I said earlier, uh, this talk is, it's two talks in one, let's say. The first part is the basics, so it's interesting for people that are new to Zig, less interesting if you already uh, know your way around uh, programming in Zig. And the second part is about an interesting corner case, and uh, it's interesting for people that are active in the community and that know um, what what's hidden in the GitHub issues. So, um, let's get started. Uh, this, I think, was my first uh, loop that I wrote in Zig or something like that. Well, at the time, there wasn't a std debug print. Uh, um, so this is a, a reenactment, let's <laughs> say it's not uh, the original code, but the idea was, I know, I just want to have a while loop. So I set up my um, indexing variable and just go iterate over it. But uh, if you program Z, you know there's something missing here, there's something wrong. And if you actually try to run it, it doesn't run, it doesn't even compile because there's a compile error. And the compile error is that uh, well, what the error message that you get is variable of type comptime int, uh, comptime int must be const or comp time, um, which is kind of a confusing error a little bit. But here's the idea. Uh, if you come from like Python or other languages, you're not used to have to specify the size of your numbers, but in Zig, sometimes you kind of have to. And to be precise, um, there's a kind of a big difference between comp time and run time. So the, the error there is not just say, something like, what are you doing? This is completely wrong. It's a, it's thinking that I'm trying to do something at comp time, while in fact, uh, that was supposed to be something that happens at runtime. Uh, and in comp time, comp time zig is kind of like Python. Like in Python, you create a variable and it can hold any number arbitrarily big, and you don't have to care about like uh, the size. But in runtime zig, you kind of have to. And I say runtime zig with a star because it's not exactly a runtime zig, but it's, um, well, we'll get to that in the next slide. So this is actually one way of fixing it. You write colon and then the type u64. It's a reasonable choice, not necessarily the right one every time, but um, that's how you're supposed to write uh, your numbers uh, most of the time. Now, uh, why? Why is this like that? Well, comp time is kind of self-aware. As I said, it's kind of like Python, so it can do um, some of the things that you can also do in Python. Well, if you were here earlier, you just saw um, Alex talk uh, where uh, he showed how much introspection you can do around types and everything else. But all this stuff, all the machinery evaporates at runtime, it disappears. Runtime is pure instinct, or to be precise, runtime is uh, once once comp time has structured a bunch of things at runtime, types don't exist anymore. You just have bytes and you have offsets and you have instructions that operate on these bytes and offsets. And so uh, if you don't have like any debugging info, you don't know something what exactly is unless you start reasoning about it. And because that's how computers kind of work. Um, so, Maybe the error message can be improved. It's a bit confusing. It's assuming that what I'm trying to do is create a comp time int, but then I'm trying to mutate it, uh, to use it in a wrong way. But my intention in that case wasn't at all to do a comp time thing. But anyway, um, I'm sure uh, in the future, this stuff can be improved. And now you know, uh, if you watch this presentation, you know that if you get that error, sometimes it's because you forgot to uh, specify how big your integer should be. And uh, going back to the runtime versus comp time thing, it has to, you have to specify the size because everything has to have a specified size. And that's how then everything works. Um, everything can tie together at runtime. So let's, start, let's talk about runtime integer sizes because there are some interesting things in there. So first of all, in Zig, you can type your own integers. So you can use I or U 
if you want a signed or an unsigned integer, and then you can write after that the number of bits you want your number, uh, your variable to uh, to occupy. So i8, u16, but you can also come up with different numbers like u75. It's fine and uh, it's very useful. Like uh, in other languages, there are just a few of those uh, specified as keywords or whatever, and um, and that's all you have. While here you you can go also up up to 65k, I believe, and that's like a current limitation that might not even not even be there in the future. Anyway, the number is gigantic, 65k bits. That's way too much for most people. Uh, but um, it's nice that you can type them down, uh, and uh, and the language understands them understands them that way, which is super cool. No secret, no top secret header file that you have to import with the right types like some other languages. Uh, there's also U size, I size, there's also a bunch of C star, uh, C underscore something something types. U size, is, I think it's the size of a pointer and like the TLDR for uh, uh, for uh, people that don't care, that don't know about too much about details and only program on like uh, boring architectures, it's either 32-bit or 64-bit. 32-bit on 32-bit machines, 64-bit on 64-bit machines. That's it. Um, I size, same, but it's signed. And then, uh, as I said, C star for interoperability with C. Uh, what about floats? Uh, floats are a bit more complicated. You have F16, 32, 64, 128. You could have an F33 in theory, but Floats are, they're not as simple as integers, and uh, I encourage you to look this up yourself. So this is like homework if you want to learn more. But long story short, um, these are, are, are the ones that you have uh, built into a language, at least until today. Um, you can also program your own integers. Um, you can use type info, you can use type, or more, more probably, uh, you don't want to use the low-level uh, APIs, um, but start just by taking a look at what's into std.meta. And in our case, since we are talking about integer numbers, there's std.meta.int, uh, which allows you, let me see if I can use my pointer, two, 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 pointer, thank you, takes in two parameters, whether the number type, the type of number that you want to get is sign, should be signed, so either I or U, right? But here you can put through or false, and uh, the number of bits it should, it should be big. So you can type them, which is useful when you are programming yourself, but you can also program them, like you can specify them programmatically at comp time, which is also useful uh, when you're writing generic code. Now, uh, let's uh, fix the code then. Uh, um, this is how uh, a loop uh, ends up working correctly. You have to specify the type, right? But in this case, I'm not using a U something something, like a U20, U64 uh, type, but I'm making my own using std meta int. And in this case, so my int is a U4, basically, right? Unsigned and then four bits. Um, and if you run this, it runs and it does what you expect, prints the number. Uh, prints the numbers uh, but again uh, bit size is important i'm sure people that are uh, used to programming in zig uh, know this already but for everybody else like if you're coming from python you have to be careful don't try to be too stingy so if you don't know just throw just make it u size just make it u64 whatever but uh, if it's too many it's fine if it's too few it's a problem so here i'm making a change i'm just using three bits but Three bits don't go up to 10, right? Three bits only get you unsigned, only get you from, go from zero to seven. They only allow eight different types of stuff. Um, so uh, this is a problem. So uh, now you run it and when you run it, you get a, an error because it, uh, uh, this is a, uh, since we are not specifying any other flag, running this uh, uh, compile makes a debug build and the debug build notices that, whoops, we get to seven, as I said, it's from zero to seven. And when we try to go one more, we wrap, we wrap around and it notices that we are overflowing. So not good. So to recap, you can type your own uh, custom ints, nice. 
you can program them using uh, I recommend to look into std.met at first that's also nice and when it's comp time uh, comp time stuff you don't have to specify the size because as I said comp time is uh, it's more self-aware it looks in, it can look in the mirror and, and recognize itself almost now if you are a new if you're new to Zig, that's it. You can go home. Congratulations. We go write your stuff. Uh, there's nothing else to see here. Uh, the world is a safe place. No evils hiding in the shadows. U0 doesn't exist and it can hurt you. So have a good night. For you, the show ends here. For everybody else. Uh oh. Can U0 hurt you? It, th th does it exist? Well, it does, and it can be confusing. Uh, this is what's happening on programming circle jerk right now. So people are debating whether you should allow a U0 type on your program in your programming language or not. And so this person is saying, well, honestly, it's an interesting debate. I'm not sure which side I stand on. Um, but in a, uh, makes sense, but in a, from a type theory perspective, but in a low level language where you expect a data type to have any memory representation that you can take errors and so on. So wh what are you doing? U0 is weird. Um, also programming circle jerk, people make uh, edgy jokes about stuff. So they also say, oh, well, you, you need U0 in Zig to represent the number of Zig jobs. Well, 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 I'll have you know, there's at least two people in the world that have a Zig job, so. Uh, there's also this one, uh, Temple OS Holy C has U0. Which side of the debate does that stronger, strengthen? Well, you decide. Uh, this one, by the way, is, is my favorite. <laughs> uh, anyway, these people are not the only ones that are finding U0 uh, interesting and, and uh, maybe confusing. Uh, if we go back to the, uh, the development uh, of Z, like a few years ago, uh, also contributors uh, had opinions on this stuff. So there was one person that was particularly against U0. And uh, this person immediately said, well, U0 is a bug. Uh, it's like, <laughs> this is like saying that we can measure the length of zero with a zero length ruler. And like the issue that says we should remove U0, this is not a proposal, this is a bug in language. And they also immediately submitted a pull request for that, which was rejected by Andrew. Now, let's have an emergency meeting. Was Andrew right or wrong at uh, rejecting the pull request? Well, in my opinion, he was actually right. And I think that PR was an impostor. But um, let, me, let me first solve this mystery uh, with a degree of ease that it, how can I say, it's understandable that while you're doing stuff, while you are designing stuff, you are unsure about things and you want to think about them in detail. Uh, but Insight is 2020, so this is the best year to do this kind of analysis. But what I mean to say is that it's easy right after the fact to come back and say, well, yeah, I think this was obviously the right choice. But um, so let me try to uh, explain that very easily and let's talk about sets. So let's start by talking about sets, but when I say sets, I don't mean like mathematical sets or whatever. I'm talking about like good old uh, data structures. So how do you make a set in Zig? Well, the Sunday library has a hash map, which is one reasonable way of implementing a set and it's a generic hash map. So you can also do a, there's a nice trick that you can use where you set the values to, uh, so you can provide types for both keys and values, right? And if you say, well, my value types are void, boom, you have a set. Kind of like in Go, you kind of do the same with maps, but then you put like an empty struct or I don't know, it's kind of clunky. It's the same idea, generally speaking. It's kind of clunky though. This is nicer. You say, well, I have no values. My values are void. And so this is the generic code. Uh, this is a simplified version of the code inside the generic hash map. And you can see that uh, it's a function, takes k and v as any types. Uh, actually, I think I got this wrong. I think they should be types. Uh, ignore the any. <laughs> Sorry, they should be just types. Um, 
So uh, you have K and B, and then inside there's the element type, so uh, the, the elements inside your, your map, and they are the K is uh, the keys of type K, the values of type V, and um, there you have it. So when you end up specifying that you want, for example, a number set, you call the function anything else, what you get um, is something like this. So you say, well, my keys are numbers, but the values are void, uh, are void, and so this field here inside the struct, this is this is valid z, this compiles, this works. Now, normally you don't just write down straight up void inside a field like it's a useless field. So most of the time, it almost doesn't make any sense. But uh, this, as a result of a uh, generic comp time thing, is absolutely reasonable. It's one of I think of the, the of the best uh, powers that you get from comp time zig. So uh, this is something that I think people shouldn't find confusing. You can use hash maps as sets. Just set values to void, and you're done. Um, so if you think this is reasonable, then the answer is that u0 is void, but for numerical ranges. And uh, let me try to show you an example. And this example is, uh, so Andrew told me that actually this example already existed as a, uh, as a test. So if you go to zig test stage one behavior bit shifting, you'll find it. Uh, my version is even more simplified, and I originally was thinking of something about like um, a generic like IP system where you have subnet masks that can change or something like this. But uh, actually, I think this example is uh, much more easier to understand. And actually, since I have a database background, I mean sharding. Uh, man, do I love sharding! Um, again, not any type, just type. Sorry, this is a, a mistake in my slides, but. Um, here's the idea, you have a map, but the map is somehow, for some reason, sharded, so uh, stuff doesn't go all in one place, but it goes in multiple place, uh, places, and you can decide, uh, and maybe um, the number of possible shards that you, have to, that you want to have, uh, you, want to, um, you want to squeeze it in a point, or you want to do some, uh, some stuff like that, or like some bit fiddling with it, and so you want to know what is the number, maximum number of shards that you want to support, and you want that to be a power of two. So uh, what you do, you, for example, might uh, get a, take in another comp time argument, S, which is, let's say it's like the, the shard space, and then your element is, every element is gonna be, is gonna have a key, a value, and the shard it belongs to, maybe something, again, it's a simplified example, it doesn't have to make practical sense, um, the way it's implemented here, it's just a slide. But the idea is that this shard then, it's of type meta int, false, s. So if we say, for example, five, it means that, or three, let's go back to our previous example, like we say s is three, that means that we can have eight shards from zero to seven. Uh, but here's the, the point. Let's say that you also want to have a sharded map that, that can collapse into a non shard map. You, it's, a, it's a map where you say, well, I want zero shards, I don't want any shard. Okay, fine. Then that means that shard is, can be a U0. There are no shards. Boom, and you're done. So that field shard becomes a U0, which again, kind of like void, it's kind of weird if you try to hard code in a struct a U0 field. I mean, you, you can if you want, but maybe that's I can think of a useful example on, off the top of my head, but this example that you see here is perfectly reasonable. Um, it's kind of like what we were doing earlier with void, and that's pretty much it. So um, let's answer some quick questions. Um, would C type system break without u0? I think not. I think you could use void. Like if u0 was forbidden, you could put void there. And like you just have an if expression, and if uh, if s if s that you're given is zero, then this becomes instead of being a u something becomes void. You can do that, uh, so this still works. Um, on the other hand, is zero then so nice that you can always use it like any other u something and never think about it anymore? Oh, not exactly. I don't think. I, I think it makes some things easier, but it doesn't like automatically solve everything. Probably think about serialization, um, or let me put it this way: 
like when, if, when you think about serialization, for example, I think you can use it like any other you star if you think that bit representations can go from zero bits to n bits or whatever. So, um, so you, you kind of have to think about it sometimes. Uh, now, of course, but what if I create a u0 variable? Hmm. I still think that the example that I just showed is the most useful one or like class of useful things you can do with u0. But yeah, what happens if you do this? Can you do this? Does it compile? What, what can you put there uh, in, you know, to replace the question mark? Can you put there 5, 10, 42? Well, you can put 0. This compiles. This works. Is this correct? Is this correct? Maybe I should give chat a little bit of time to think about this and, uh, and decide whether this should be considered correct or not. Can you put, you're putting a zero into a U zero thing. Does this work? I, it, should this be like this? Uh, well, first let's recap. Use u0 as a limit case when you're doing comp time stuff and, um, and you have a numeric range that you want to make variable. But still be on the lookout for situation where you kind of still might want to special case it. Like for example, in the case of serialization, if you have a u0 field, do you want to write it down in the serialized file or omit it or what? Well, I think it depends actually on on your use case. Uh, and that's all there is to it, really. Like, from a practical standpoint, in my opinion, this is all you have to care about. And this is where U0 can be useful for you. Everything else is just uh, like uh, theory crafting. But now, let's go into the rant. Is this correct? I think it's the wrong question. If you start thinking in those terms, I think you risk getting yourself into the same mental state that some people got themselves into. So let's try to reframe this a little bit. I think it's a reasonable choice because it's useful. Um, and by the way, all this stuff can be programmed in a different way, right? Uh, you can decide, like, uh, when uh, Andrew or whoever wrote that specific code can make uh, a zero variable behave, work in different ways in, in the context. You, do, you can have everything right you sometimes you are constrained by certain rules but you still have a lot of agency there so another choice could be to have the a user variable be equal to one always um kind of weird i think but it's just to show how different possibilities are there um and again i might be missing out on some small detail while you are implementing it that may, where maybe making you zero equal to zero uh makes everything easier and, and making it equal to one would make it more clunky, but whatever. Another option could be, well, you could not allow assignment to use zero variables. You could say, well, you, you zero is a type, but you, you can't assign anything to it ever. Kind of weird, maybe, but let's take inspiration from some friends that uh, are super hot on type stuff. And while well, they have a empty enum, this enum doesn't have any case, and for them, what they, what they do with that is that they have this result thing where um, basically your function returns a result can, that it, it's a union can either be error or okay. So it can re represent failures. Uh, and sometimes you want to conform your function to that interface, but at the same time, you can't fail. So how can you convey that there is no failure option for your function while still having to conform yourself to the result thing. Well, you say, well, my error type is infallible. So it's the point is it's never going to happen. And that's maybe useful for some humans. And I don't know, maybe it's useful also for the Rust compiler. Now, uh, can I say that this is the right choice in an absolute sense? It's this good design is an absolute sense. I have no idea. I, I don't know. But given what I know about their type system, it seems reasonable. It conveys some meaning. So why, why am I stressing this point so much? Well, the point is, theory is a tool for achieving better practical outcomes. At least when it comes to software engineering, emphasis on engineering. I'm sure that if you're a mathematician and you want to think about theory uh, for aesthetic reasons, sure, um, no problem. But at least for us, uh, if you forget that this, 
the theory is a tool for better practical outcomes, we're going to write lousy software. So um, long story short, um, is uh, assigning zero to U0 um, correct? Again, not a good question. It's reasonable. It works. Um, but let's say, again, I don't have not even remotely all the context that, for example, Andrew has on this issue. But let's say in a uh, hypothetical uh, future or uh, alternative universe where everybody uh, uses U0 and assign stuff to it and assign zero to it and get confused that U0 behaves uh, in weird ways. Maybe at that point you can make the choice of saying, well, you know what, what? let's forbid people from assigning to it and that's, that's the end of it. So at least we prevent people from making that mistake. That would be also reasonable, I think. Now, there might, as I said, there might be some uh, minor uh, or like consequences that I can't see. Um, but, but this mindset is the right mindset to have when thinking about this stuff. So let's, let me answer one final question, which I think is also interesting, uh, which is still kind of theoretical, but uh, interesting and, and still kind of useful, uh, useful to know. So how can a value be stored in zero bits, right? Use zero is zero bits. How can you put zero in there, right? Well, here's an interesting uh, thing to think about, um, especially if you uh, if you haven't learned much about information theory. There is a relationship between bits and uh, probability, but to keep things uh, simpler, let's just say between bits and possibilities. So when you say this is a U3 variable, you're saying that the, the universe, uh, the set of things that I can describe is eight separate things that you want to distinguish. And you know that to disambiguate between these eight different possibilities, you need three bits. And six, for example, is one of these eight. Now, when you say you zero, you're kind of saying there's only one possibility. And so there's nothing to disambiguate. Or let me flip it around. Since you, three bits allow you to disambiguate between eight different things, zero bits don't allow you to disambiguate between any. So you can say there is only one possibility. Now, should that possibility be zero? Uh, that's reasonable in many ways. You can, if you uh, search the uh, relevant issue, you will find that uh, if you uh, look at powers of two and whatever else, math kind of makes that that work nicely. Um, but the point is, no bits it means only one possibility. So, how should one that one possibility map to other types? Well, that's up to you. And here's what I mean by that. Uh, if you look at this code, you see there is this while i minor than 10. So this 10, by virtue of being 10, means that there are at least 10 different things that this type has to discriminate uh, between. So this is a, a, oops, this is at least four bytes. Uh, maybe more, we don't know, but at least it's four. And Make in 10 compared to a U3 doesn't make sense. A U3 doesn't have a concept of 10. These are different types. U3, U4, these are different types, but you are still making them in relation to one another. So it's up to you how you want to map them. Of course, the obvious choice is you align them or you, or another way of saying that would be you cast the U3 to U4 and we have a well-defined way of doing so and it generally makes sense and it works well for us. Sure, absolutely. Um, but that's what you're doing. Let me bring this back. How the one possibility should map to other types, it's up to you. So uh, maybe other languages don't allow you to implicitly uh, cast a U3 or have a U3 interact with a U4 and they want you to explicitly cast it first. So there are different ways that you can do this stuff and it's always the choice, the explicit choice of somebody. So is that code broken? For example, this is the three bit version, right? The one that doesn't go up to 10. So is this code broken? I mean, if you ask the bug, a debug build, like the build, the debug build zig, it, it, it is. If you ask release fast zig, uh, not really, because it keeps working. Although, in the case of Zig, 
there's this nice operator that means that when you want wraparound semantics, you have to be explicit about it. So yes, it's broken, but maybe in another language without that operator, uh, it's not as broken. So again, the point is, it's how you want things to interact with one another. And type and theory helps you understand the consequences and the implications of setting something to something, but you still have a ton of agency. And um, you should not try to um, think of this in a religious way where everything has too much together to how math uh, says it should be. It's, um, it's a fool's errand. And actually, in that regard, if you like thinking in abstract terms, here's a recommendation. Check out this book. It's called Gödel, Escher and Bach. Um, I, from Douglas Hofstadter, I stumbled upon this book in my first year in university and man, was I lucky. Um, it really f set for me uh, the tone uh, of how to think about this stuff and what to expect, what not to expect. And spoilers, I think this book is from the 80s, so it's uh, spoilers on our 40 year old book. Uh, this whole book, it's a very, very long story, but uh, but interesting. Don't get me wrong. I, I highly recommend it. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's kind of thick. I don't remember the number of pages, uh, but it is kind of thick. Uh, and it's a long story just to explain one the implications of one math theorem where one guy uh, found out that it actually demonstrated that uh, math in all formal systems are kind of broken or more precisely, incomplete. And so don't treat this stuff as a religion. It's not going to get you anywhere. That's the end. And uh, after zero, there's nothing uh, confusing in Zig um, at all. So everything else is super simple. Um, and yeah, let's not talk about anything else, at least not today. So now, is there any question? So actually, let me see. Let me see some of the comments that were sent uh, in the meantime. Oh man! <laughs> so there were a, a few yes, a few no to the uh, should you zero be zero <laughs> question. <laughs> yeah, everyone has opinions. <laughs> what about no return? No return doesn't exist and it can't hurt you. So don't worry. I think. <laughs> I don't know. What about no return? By the way, I'm not a compiler or program language developer. So everything that I'm saying, I'm saying from the perspective of somebody that uses stuff. But um from the perspective of somebody who uses stuff, no return is another super simple idea. Yes, it kind of sounds confusing, but why is no return a return type? What, what, what does that mean? I think the answer is that if you have, for example, a function that should return a number uh, or, or actually, yeah, a function that should return a given type, and then inside you have a switch, and inside the switch you have like three branches, you want all three branches to return the same thing that the function has to return, right? Having one branch that returns a number, another branch that returns a struct, that doesn't work in the type system. So, um, so the type system has to make sure that all the return types match, make sense. But if one of the branches causes the program to crash because it sends an interrupt signal or whatever, or it flips a switch and burns your computer, then it doesn't matter what the return type is. And that's what no return is. I guess no return is a type that always matches with other types, because if you get down that path, it doesn't matter because the return type is not going to be part of the equation anymore. Uh, at least that's what I can gather from um, thinking about it logically as a user. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's... Uh, there's more to it, so you can ask Andrew about uh, more nuanced implications. Um, yeah, at least that's one property, I would say. Since uh, it's, it's easily testable, right? Because if you have a switch in, in Zig and you have two cases that 
uh, return the right type, but then the third case panics. You know, the panic is going to blow everything up and the panic is not going to return the expected type. So it returns a type that has to be compatible. Anyway, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So, uh, means that doesn't seem to be any, any question. Let me see. The two. <laughs> Yeah, but by the way, um, yeah, some people also described U0 as Zig's billion dollar mistake. Mm -mm -mm. Not the right way of thinking about stuff. Not recommended. Okay, I, uh, I don't think we have any questions. So let me, let me give a spoiler like last time for what I'm working on and let's bringing this show to an end. By the way, 30 minutes for the whole presentation, I'd say not bad. I hope I didn't go too fast um, in case, let me know. But well, I'm for the next show time, I'm working on error, panic or unreachable. Uh, again, it's another talk for mostly for people that are approach are starting with Zeek or like not super experts. Uh, I found these, uh, I found myself asking the question multiple times and getting it wrong by the way. So um, I think that, that it's going to be interesting uh, for 